Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, Leftology again after another what four month hiatus. Um, hopefully, you're enjoying the anti Oedipus reading group series that I'm using to maintain this uh, channel's life at all. Uh, but today, I'm going to uh, bring in. I guess you can go ahead and introduce yourself. I I don't know if I can do it justice. Hi, I'm John. I am a friend of Cam, new friend. I met Cam through Taylor Adkins, um, who runs Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour, tipped me out to um, the Annie Oedipus Reading Group, and we connected, and we just started talking, bitching about <laughs> various, you know, like issues in academia, problems of theory, other people not reading as many books as we do, blah, blah, blah. So, and then he invited me to be on the pod and I said, okay, sure. And yeah, yeah. Did. I, I kind of want to use the podcast for uh, more casual conversation. Sorry if you guys can hear like the thunderstorm happening in the, the background there. Um, but I guess what I wanted to get over today was, as we discussed before we started recording, kind of... Um, like, what is theory? Because that's kind of the aspect of philosophy that I've always been interested in ever since I really got into it my uh, sophomore year of college two years ago now. Um, and I, I just went, I went the a speed run route of theory, basically, um, and then turned around and I was like, wait, only 5% of all philosophy jobs uh, apply to what I do. Um, so maybe I should probably talk to some other people about what this, uh, I guess, subfield of philosophy really is. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's a good kind of first discussion question would be, um, what is theory? Or one of the six, I guess, questionnaire, how is theory? Why is theory? <laughs> Where is theory? Uh, when is theory? Uh, not now. Um, <laughs> yeah, so like... maybe in the future, maybe theory will be good again. Yeah, man. So I thought I was, I've been thinking about this for a few days and I kept coming back to a quotation from uh, James, Fred Jameson's um, recent, I think most recent book called Allegory and Ideology, which is a kind of end of, you know, end of career opus that he put out a few years ago, kind of trying to synthesize his biggest ideas from Marxism and form um what's what's the other ones um uh political unconscious postmodernism and antinomies of realism so it's this kind of huge sort of synthetic project but it opens or one of the one of the early chapters opens with this really helpful image that is clarified for me what it is that i do um and how it is that i do what i do um so it's a it's a little bit long would you mind if i you mind if I read it? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So this is from Allegory and Ideology. Um, it is a vast and ill-lit basement intersected by pipes of all sizes of various materials in various states of de deterioration without obvious passageways and obstructed by tanks and storage containers of all sizes each one of which pipes and tanks alike sporting dials and glass panels of equal variety, whose registers, clocks, meters, thermometric pressure gauges, numerical scales, quadrants, warning lights, and calibrations are in constant surveillance by the innumerable historians in their white coats and checkboards, jostling one another as they jockey for a look or sneer at their neighbors. No one knows how many kinds of measurements are in play, nor even the antiquity of some of the devices, each of which registers the variable rates of different indicators, such as water pressure, temperature, instability, consumption, luxury goods, life expectancy, annual film production, salinity, ideology, average weight, average heat, church attendance, guns per family, and the rate of extinction of species. Those who have concluded that these tasks are meaningless sit against the wall in various states of fatigue. Others race frantically back and forth to invent a master statistic that might encompass all these random findings, while still others concentrate stubbornly on their own calculations and substitute their own algorithms, which may or may not have any relation to those of their neighbors. 
None of these dials registers history directly, of course. It exists somewhere outside this basement, and all the dials seem to record it in one way or another. You could certainly call it an absent cause or an untotalizable totality if you think it exists, but no one has ever seen anything but the gauges and their needles, the numbers and their rise and fall, which vary wildly and require separate monitors. Despite this, there persist the occasional joint cooperative efforts along with the most unsubstantiated generalizations and a tacit conviction, if not mutual agreement, that there must be something or other out there. So that to me gets at the essence of what it is that we do. History theory is a discourse, it's an activity, it's a mode of thinking, reading, and writing that attempts to locate certain objects of analysis within a historical totality. Um, that tries to take the world not as a bundle of disconnected facts, such as how um, liberal historicism might, or how new historicism, or how any of these sort of mainstream approaches to cultural objects or um, sociological history do, but that try to take every mo every fact and every point within a totality in relation to that which is outside it. Um, it must be historical, it must be dialectical, and it must have a sense of both signification and the unconscious. Um, those, to me, are the four points that define something as theory. History, dialectic, signification, unconscious. Um, I realize this is kind of a narrow definition to some people, but... Outside I mean, of Hegel like, dialectic, right? Well, I don't mean... I mean, dialectic, not in the sense of like, you know, um, Althusser's, you know, Hegelian reading of history or anything like that, like, or what Althusser says, Hegel says. Um, I don't mean that in terms of like diamat, Soviet, Stalinist, dialectical materialism. I mean it in terms of like, just the idea that any fact is only understandable if you understand its total context. Um, every fact is inseparable from its total context and the effort of thought is to place things in the, in that, within that absolute horizon, which is impossible, like which we can't do, but the work of theory is to try to build models and graphs and systems and measurements and register um, those relationships. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's like, <laughs> so I, I guess Foucault comes to mind here because I remember uh, it was a TikTok on Foucault that I saw like a year or so ago, and it was kind of like asking Foucault where his thesis statement was. And I'm like, it there isn't <laughs> one. It's the fact that there's a thousand cases that prove the same point or prove right. this historical totality. Um one of Foucault's themes, I think, is that maybe this is on or off topic. It's that if there's any, there's no meaning behind any suffering, but we're at the heart of it always. Um, that's probably his biggest theme throughout everything. But there's um, actually, I don't know if there's a single work by Foucault that that theme does not penetrate at least once. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess between them trying to offer this history but case by case of how human um society or this particular aspect of human society is built up through these either customs or norms or this means of control or power etc it's not the fact that he has an argument for it he's just showing you the cases and hoping that you'll kind of figure out the totality on your own to some degree uh, yeah, and, and what Foucault's interested in tracking is um, he's Deleuze says this in his book on Foucault. Um, Foucault is really interested in two things. He's interested in statements and he's interested in dispositifs or apparatuses, right? And he's interested in the ways that almost imperceptibly those two things shift. Um, how 
over the course of the 18th into the 19th century, the kinds of statements one can make about um, natural species, about political economy, about um, mathematics, et cetera, like how the kinds of statements we can make changes at an almost, in a way, almost like evolution. Um, not it, I'm not describing it as evolution, but it's a similar mechanism, like slow, slow, slow creep, and then all at once, bam, you know, a like kettle, like, you know, the example that comes to mind is statistics, right? The first um, statistical tables of populations measuring um, the rate of suicide emerges in the late 16th, early 17th century in England. This as a method of sort of keeping an eye on populations, of getting a sense of how many are being born, how many people are dying, um, who's paying taxes, you know, if when people are dying, what are they dying of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, that practice begins in England in the 1600s. I mean, it, it it happens in China also much earlier than that, but like the in the West and in Europe, it begins in these statistical tables. Um, that That's continued, that sort of propagates into France, into Prussia, into all these places. But, it, but in 1845, Ket Alphonse Ketele comes up with the concept of the average man, where he says, the average man is the man of statistics, is the one that I write into the statistical table when I, you know, um, in the sense of like, how many people um, committed suicide by jumping off a bridge, 17. <laughs> that this, the average man is the unit of statistics and he becomes a new kind of historical figure. Um, he becomes utterable. Um, there is no there is no average man before Ketelet make sort of conjures him into being, even though he had an effective existence in the, in the statistical table for hundreds of years prior. Does that make sense? Yeah, he wasn't seen by the forces of power, I guess. Uh, he becomes real when he becomes real to the state to some degree, I he becomes articulated. Yeah, he he is real in a sense, but he become he is produced as a statistical fiction. He's articulated at this particular moment in 1845 when Ketelet publishes. Um, oh, God, I forget what the what the book is called. I should know. I was writing it about it in my dissertation. But um, when Ketelet publishes a particular book, um, he introduced the concept of l'homme moyen or um average man. Oh, so but. I guess what I'm trying to say here is that this is how Foucault operates by like the infinite set of cases that are all the same, that all sort of speak to a similar regime, that all connect up to a similar apparatus, you know, the disciplinary society, the biopolitical regime, um, the medical apparatus, et cetera. But at the same time, he's tracking the tiny minute differ differences and differentials between each of those points. Um, and looking for what he calls the statement, which is this almost like oracular break from previous statements where a new thing is said. Um, and that's theory to me in a in a huge way. It's about tracking the ways that how the ways we see the world are suddenly flipped, how a new sort of flash of light happens in the clearing. Um, and a new facet of the world becomes illuminated to sort of like steal from Heidegger. And Foucault was a Heideggerian. Yeah, I, I, I can see, I can see it at least in the uh, Aletheia term of things for Heidegger, mm -hmm. that Foucault would be that, because um, I, I, I think it literally just clicked, kind of why Foucault starts Manus and Civilization, uh, with kind of that discussing lepers and the transition of the leper facilities to. Um, I guess the 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 madhouses and the uh like early renaissance the transition into like having institutionalized right. um centers for what the state deems are mad and it 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 kind of seems that Foucault is telling us it's like you 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 see over there that Hindu culture has these untouchables and they call them untouchables but if you come over here to Europe we also have an untouchable they used to be lepers but now they're the madmen um, mm -hmm. And we just really, really don't like saying that we also have this untouchable group in society um, because we're the ones that we've created them and we've maintained their system or we've maintained mm -hmm. the system of oppression that keeps them in their place. 
um, and our and maintains our relation to such types of people. Right. Um, and that's like a kind of a clash between two different apparatuses, right? The colonial apparatus that says that separates the European man from the sort of um, from the Indian or from like the from the Eastern man. Yeah. Uh, on one hand, that introduces that ideology that says, like, you know, you are free because they are enslaved. And the um, the carceral apparatus. Right. Um, yeah. That sort of and the medical apparatus. So it's this sort of meeting between really the three major, um, I guess, subjects that Foucault deals with. Madness is such a perfect, it's it's about, it's about incarceration, it's about medicine, it's about colonialism, like his sort of three central themes. Yep. Yeah, uh, Foucault becomes increasingly popular, even though I don't know if I'll ever write on him. I think his writings will be useful in like another way, I guess. But I, I guess the side point was, I don't know if there's a single day where it doesn't seem that the politics of at least disability or those that are deemed um, less able to some degree by the, the state apparatus. I don't know if there's a single day where it doesn't become more important to understand that type of politics mm -hmm. um, because it is kind of the, it is Foucault naturally or not naturally. Um, he hates nature. Um, Foucault <laughs> finds um that like the west has just kind of drawn the line between human and non-human and hasn't included persons only on one side of that thing or on one side of that line um there is a point where humans or persons or humans or whatever you want to call them uh can be deemed non-human by this apparatus of power and kind of taken their autonomy away from and you can argue whether Foucault is a moralist or not um, mm -hmm. but that's not necessarily something we want happening, whether we want to agree that there is some universal moral system or not. Um, I, I that's kind of a sidetrack, but it is kind of just, uh, I remember, I forget if it was acid horizon or machine and conscious. Cause they, they blend together way too much, especially when I haven't listened to the episode in a while. But, uh, the point that I, I heard on them it, half a year, maybe a year ago or more, uh, they had a Foucaultian on um, that wasn't Will from Acid Horizon um, mm -hmm. discussing what teaching Foucault is like because it that that's where I, I think I started with him was because from that podcast episode I learned that Foucault is not about the thesis statement it's not about this argument um, he's not trying to convince your like conscious mind of anything he's trying to convince your eyes to see differently right no and he's giving you a tool Right. It's the Deleuzian point of like a book is a weapon. Yeah. Right. Which they took from George Jackson um, that like a. And I and I do think, you know, for better or worse, that this goes back to his sort of Heideggerian leanings that like what philosophy does is it illuminates a new section of being for you. You stand in the world and you're able to suddenly see something I taught. Um, when I was a TA, I'm not right now, I'm finishing my dissertation. I do not have time to teach. <laughs> but like when I was a TA, I taught um, YA literature, like like a class on children's lit. And we read one novel, the title of which I'm forgetting, which was a sort of high school romance, you know, like like the kind of which there are hundreds, thousands. Yeah. Right? That's sort of like, and and the way we taught it was through Foucault. Um, presenting the school as a disciplinary apparatus. And let me tell you, there is nothing more fun to teach than to explain to a bunch of 19-year-olds the panopticon for the first time. <laughs> like to draw it on the board and go through the whole thing and to look around the room and see them all go, oh shit, this is, <laughs> you know, like to, to have them say, to say like, you know, the prisoners, I mean, we don't need to go into it, but like, you know, they're like, the prisoners never know when they're being watched, so they watch themselves. And that this is the plot of, in many ways, of almost every high school film, of almost every um, sort of high school book of like these sort of network of gazes. Everybody is not, is watching themselves being watched by others who are watch, like, you know, and to see them and to see these kids, many of whom were, are highly privileged, many of whom, some of whom aren't see that illuminated for themselves for the first time you know it's it's almost trite we, we joke about it on twitter now 
like oh yeah the prison everything's a prison this is a prison that's a prison you know the oprah meme you're you get a prison and you get a prison and you get like like that's sort of how it feels for somebody who has spent their life reading this stuff but like to for a young undergraduate to encounter that for the first time it's totally mind-blowing it's totally and it can be life-changing um and that i guess is gets me back to jameson you know who says you know history is what hurts right that's the great line from political unconscious and theory is a way of naming our hurt of coming to terms with our hurt of saying why you know who hurt me and why and how do i you know not heal it there's no healing like we're wounded you know and we live in the wound we are the wound we are nothing but the wound of history but you know how can i get a grip on it how can i gain the slightest amount of agency more than i had yesterday and to do that every day um that i see that as my job in a lot of ways like as a professor in a dying field <laughs> or as a, a TA and perhaps future professor in a dying field, like, you know, no, I, you know, these kids, I hope that they learn to love George Eliot and Herman Melville or whoever else. I love them. I hope that they do too. But more than that, I see my job as like giving them, giving them a weapon to deal with a world that hurt, has hurt them and will continue to, you know, that's, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a good transition to kind of like, to saying it's a dying field i really hope not because i got i'm what six years behind you so um i really hope there's <laughs> professor jobs there when i enter the field in like 2031 or something there will be jobs they just won't be good and but they're not good now so who cares i, I mean, hope i hope they get better um yeah. but i guess a, a big thing for me i guess if we can turn our gaze towards academia would be kind of um the numbers game that has become like majoring in college to a degree, at least at an undergraduate level, um, graduate school is slightly less. Uh, but I guess to go through like the history that you get told for politics and analytic philosophy, to really, I guess, to set the stage before we even get into neoliberalism is because you kind of hear that it, like by the fifties and sixties with the, the student, I guess, revolts in the time, Adorno, Marcuse, and the people who do critical theory um, or people associated with them, or even existentialism, because Sartre was a communist, mm -hmm. um, or associated with it. Um, kind well, of Sartre, get... Sartre was, I mean, Sartre was a Stalinist. He, yeah. you know, an unrepentant. The worst Stalinist. kind. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I mean, he, his Stalinism is incredibly interesting and important for his reception, but whatever. This is a hobby horse of mine, but go on. Yeah, but um, it, that, it does kind of from the little bit I know of at least early analytic, the like 20s, 30s, 40s era of it, like to get to the 50s and 60s during the McCarthy trials and the, the wake of the Red Scare and to see kind of analytic philosophy be picked out as this kind of like depoliticized aspect of philosophy mm -hmm. is very weird. Like I, I know I'm on Twitter as like the, the number one hate of analytic philosophy or mm -hmm. number one hater of analytic philosophy, like a, the pure continental if there was one. But it, it almost does kind of seem disappointing because you have figures like Bertrand Russell who lived till what, the 1960s or something, and he was a staunch socialist his entire life. So were yeah. most of the other people who were around for the Vienna Circle and other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and even though I think their stuff is incredibly boring, at least they had some spine. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I don't think... And I think we're at a point where analytic philosophy isn't depoliticized quite as much anymore, especially with the advent of feminist politics or not feminist politics, feminist philosophy in like the seventies through the nineties really kicking up in England and America. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess the long tirade of history, I think I want to get to with like analytic being the 90% of the field now, if not slightly more um, right. is kind of, it seems that at least what the algorithm gives me on social media, a lot of people are trying to play this, like I said, a numbers game with majoring in college where they go in, whether they're not, whether they're good at it or not into this field that's may make them 130,000 a year at an average. They're, they're looking at the long game rather of their like wallet more than what they can 
kind of do to give themselves a better outlook in the world. Um, Because as my, one of the philosophy professors in my department explained um, before he, um, before he left um, earlier this year, was that the, there's kind of this difference between this the humanities and STEM, and it's like STEM can give you really good in about one job or a, a sub a subfield of jobs um, if you only do STEM. But if if you do a humanities major, what you're gonna learn is to kind of appreciate thinking in one way or another, and uh, a mm-hmm. lot of people can call that an excuse to really enjoy this dying field um, that is the humanities side of any university. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I do think there is to a degree that it is true because even in my own life, I feel happier to one degree or another. Um, mm-hmm. Actually being able to like analyze the world that I live in, which is not something you really get to do as a what chemistry major or a, especially a business major when you have to draw inside the lines for to get 100 right. in your class. Um, yeah, so like there's there's a whole history to this, right? And I mean, I am not a historian of labor, I, I wanted to be for actually a little bit, but I I sort of backed back down from that route for a number of reasons. But I will say that to major in, say, STEM or today is, as I understand it, quite different than it would have been, say, you know, several decades ago, pre-1970s. Um, there's a kind of professionalizing and job training aspect to it Um, you are being trained very much to perform a certain task to work in a certain job often professors in given departments will have projects that relate to sort of stuff that given companies are doing and there's a sort of a pipeline established for you I mean I don't begrudge I mean I came from a working class background I don't begrudge anybody their right to get theirs I mean, at a certain point, you know, to sort of, if you come, well, maybe that's, maybe I do begrudge them a little bit, but. Don't be a class trader, but get the bag. I'm not a class. I mean, I, under, what I guess I mean is like, I try not to moralize decisions like that, that my own students have made, that my friends have made, that my colleagues have made. Um, it's not for me. It's not something I have the skill set to do. And it's not something I have the stomach for. Um, What I will say is that technical training, especially in the case of business, business schools, much of what you learn in business school is stuff that you would have been taught on the job, like several decades ago. You would have learned it on the job. You had just been taught it by like your superior in like three weeks. And they've, you know, they, they have tricked now two or three generations of young people into paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for what they would have learned on the job in three weeks a few years like you know several decades ago um it is it's it's like what football it's like what like professional football does with college football like (laughs) you know rather than support a minor league where the teams are paying the players etc they just let the colleges train train the players and then they draft them once they're out of college that is essentially what like many American corporations have done with business school, quote unquote, whatever that even means anymore. The MBA, I mean, I don't have it. I don't know the history of the MBA, the MBA, not the NBA, <laughs> um, but it it's hard for me sometimes because I want them to sit down and say, Well, you know, teacher, professor, whoever, you've shown me all this. My eyes are open. I'm going to, you know, change my like change my life. I realize that this path I'm on is not going to make me happy, that making six figures a year is not going to make me happy, that like, you know, sort of becoming a lawyer like my dad is not going to make me happy. And I want it for them. I want that for them. But I can't fight it, you know, all I can do is give them as, you know, in, in, my, in my position as a graduate student, as a TA, as not even really a mentor, I don't have advisees or anything like that. All I can really do is say, hey man, like here's some some resources. I had a student once, um, 
I don't think he would mind if I told this story. Um, he was probably the best student I ever had. Brilliant. He wrote, he was in my um, children's lit class. He wrote an amazing kick-ass paper about um, children's picture books, um, black children's picture books from the 60s, um, and just sort of how they presented blackness and whiteness um, and, you know, cultural and like, it was, it was a really, it was a fantastic paper. Um, it was, he did readings of images, readings of text, readings of um, publication history, et cetera. Great kid. Um, the last day of class, he like, he asked me if he can walk with me to my car. And I say, yeah, sure. Like, let's talk. Like, what do you, what's up, man? And he's like, oh, can you give me some stuff? You know, give me some things, some um, thinkers, some philosophers, some political theorists, some folks to look at and think with um, because I'm interested in activism and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, yeah. And I said, let me think about it. And I wrote him like a six page email with like a dozen books in it and summaries of each of the, I got so freaking excited because I love this stuff and I want, like it was, you know, a student who actually cared. And I said, yeah, this is amazing. And he, and he sent me an email back. That was like two paragraphs. That was basically like, Hey man, thanks for this. Do you have any uh, good YouTube interviews with these guys? Cause I don't really have time to read these books. <laughs> and that hurt. You know, I wasn't like personally offended, but I was sort of depressed by that. And I said, yeah. And I sent him the Foucault Chomsky, <laughs> the Foucault Chomsky debate and just let him have it. But, you know, but at some, but it was, I don't know what you do. Um, especially with a generation, multiple generations of students who come up after 2008 that are told to be pragmatic, who are told that philosophy and English and compliment and foreign language and all this stuff will never get you a job that it's a major for dummies. Like, I really think that that one John Mulaney special, like, <laughs> killed the English major worse than almost anything else in some way. You know, it's hard. How do you convince these students that this stuff matters? And increasingly, the students who do major are from private schools, are, you know, have academic parents or highly educated parents, um, are people who have been primed to be a kind of cultural elite. And that depresses me. I want my working class kids to read this stuff and not see themselves in. I think that's a fucking awful expression, but to like, to, re to see how this is their world too. Um, and it's hard. It just is hard, you know. It's not discouraging. I'm not discouraged. I still love the work, but it's does it does this all make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm kind of the uh I guess at least on the continental side, the the guy that does like philosophy, par philosophy in my department, like just kind of does the readings and then does my own little readings on the side as well. So I, I get I mean, not from a teacher's perspective, but I, I get the, see the other philosophy majors, not necessarily on that level. Those that I get, there's a lot, or of the few we have in my department, there's a lot of people that literally genuinely care, but are kind of stuck by the, the fact that they kind of do want, they don't have the time to go to doctoral school or get a master's in philosophy, at least as the first one, uh, or as, the, or as their first graduate degree. Um, maybe some when they're like 30 or 40 down the line or something. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of people that I, I see that I'm like, you have a lot of potential for this. Like you're, you're really great. I, I like discussing in class with you these things. If you just didn't want to be like a, a lawyer, you could be this great professor, even though I imagine you're probably also going to be a great lawyer. Um, this is the whole other thing. I don't want to dig myself a hole. Um, cause there's, oh, no, I've, I have classmates that are generally going to do probably good things, be like a green, uh, environmentalist lawyer or something like that. People that generally care about all these issues that are going into these other fields. Um, and I'm glad they're not adding supply to the job market for philosophy, but, um, it, at least as like a self-interested, somebody who wants that job in six, seven years. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, but, and remember that, you know, the academy is not the only place where philosophy happens. Yeah, yeah. The There's academy, all... especially not the only place where theory happens. People love theory. People, more people are reading theory now than ever um, because of 
things like zero and repeater because yeah. of like certain series yeah, i started of- with capitalist realism so it was zero yeah. books that got me into philosophy yeah and i mean mark fisher i mean mark fisher produced he produced a lot of things um but he produced a generation of bloggers in a, in a and many of those blogs are kind of bad <laughs> and like most many sure, of those most statistically have to be yeah like of course right like but like the fact like he is a kind of electrifying writer he's not right about everything he's not you know his sort of sympathies with land that for that i in my opinion sort of stuck around to the end almost um are disturbing but he produced a kind of discourse and a kind of writing that is the best of what theory can do Yeah, to take objects and put them in their context and to show how there's this reciprocal action between them. Um, you know, yeah, yeah that, that way, was kind of the, like, yeah. that was kind of the, I guess I got an intense feeling of that reading post capitalist desire from repeater. Cause you read it and you get as, I don't know what it would be at the end of the book. If it's just kind mm-hmm. of like a little paragraph or two on what his students did after he died, because he died in the middle of a lecture series um, mm-hmm. during the winter break between the, I guess, the fifth and sixth lecture, I think. Yeah. And it, you kind of get this feeling it's like this great thinker is gone, but also are we stuck here now because he's gone? Like, what would the other four lectures, what the other four or five lectures would have provided us? Like I, yeah. I almost started tearing not just because all this like great theory was gone, but also because you could really feel that a person was gone even within the pages of that own book. Yeah, you could feel like somebody yeah. who genuinely cared about those students was just not in the world anymore. There is a reading those pages after having taught and taught theoretical texts to undergraduates. And I think I believe his students are master students, but still same same difference. We're all stupid. Um, it it was this. How do I say this? It was you can feel him almost wanting to pick up the students and shake them. Like, why can't you get this? This is like, you know, Lukacs, you know, just like like he like caring so much and just wanting every single person in that room to understand what he's saying and to get the import of it for their day-to-day lives. Um, which is, I think, the best thing a professor can do is to model a certain kind of life. Um, I've thought this often, like, you know, the things you remember from your great professors is very rarely a lecture unless it's one or two very great lectures, but it's about a, a whole style of living and of thinking and of sort of a form of life. And I don't mean like wearing tweed and sort of like smoking cigarillos and, you know, being a I don't mean like that stuff, but I mean like, oh God, like, you know, be like an intelligent person who's willing to give things up, to like give up certain material comforts for, to pursue a thought. You know, my advisor, my primary advisor um, gave me, I took a class with him, um, Russ Leo, who is a, an amazing um, early modernist, Spinozist. He's writing a book on anti-psychiatry right now. Um, which yeah, he's just, he's an amazing guy. But when I took my first class with him on Spinoza and Spinozism and like sort of post-Marxist Spinozisms, he gave me a model, a new model of how to be a thinking person of like how to confront life every day, not philosophically, like not like a sort of Seneca sort of that, but, but like how to, take things and sort of turn them on their head and always see um, the more interesting side of of whatever you're encountering the guy loves x-men for some reason i still don't really understand why he loves x-men but like you know or like um that to me was you know nothing he in particular that he said and not even any of his ideas or any of his sort of theses or whatever he's not that kind of teacher but just this style of dealing with the world um that's not tortured that's not um overwrought that's not sort of distant that's not angry but also not um sort of passive 
it was it was uh, eye opening for me, and I try to emulate that in my own way. He'd be so fucking embarrassed if he ever saw this interview. Jesus Christ, um, <laughs> Russ, turn off the camera. Um, but yeah, yeah, I I I do believe that that is what. And I mean, that can also take ugly forms. Like, you know, everybody has a professor who, everybody's known a professor who like maintains this weird cult of personality around himself and it's always a himself, Yeah, um, you know, which is a whole other thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just like a model for life, um, for a better way of living, you know. I don't think that that's too much to ask. Yeah, it, it is a very it should interesting pay me more way. to do it but that's not too much to ask what yeah it is it is a very interesting way to go into philosophy because it kind of i don't know the continental side just seems to get at that at least more if not purely um that side um because it, it kind of seems like we do have these arguments like anti oedipus has this argument like mm -hmm. it, it has this I think against Freud, it wants to prove that Oedipus has all these other consequences that it's not. I'm just saying it because it's it's right here. Um, mm -hmm. It has all these consequences um, and these these what, contingent structures that build it up. But by the end of the book, you get this way of living, this way of viewing how you've been formed as a human that is completely different than before, mm -hmm. because. It, it, the Nietzscheanism and I guess the to degree the Spinozism also because Deleuze kind of doesn't really separate the two as a tradition they're kind of both the tradition of a weird rationalist irrationalism mm -hmm. um if that that makes sense within the continental world uh I believe but to nobody mm -hmm. else that would be like what the hell are you talking about um but there's this kind of way of living where you, the Deleuze gives you Deleuze and Glattery combined. Don't forget Glattery. Um, he's important too. Um, they give you this way of living that isn't about meaning, and it kind of does help with the past, um, especially with kind of the anti psychiatry that they end up doing with schizoanalysis. Mm -hmm. In that, what you are, even if you're on the periphery of whatever the body is, um, or the full body is, um. Mm -hmm um you are contingently made up of what functions it, it is kind of a darwinism to some degree um which i may or may not we may have gotten into the reading groups a little bit but kind of what i was getting on is like we form out of what functions that's kind of the view that i get out of anti-oedipus there's not really a meaning behind it just like we discussed with Foucault there's no real true meaning to all the history of human suffering just like there's no meaning to the suffering that formed us of who we are um mm -hmm. Deleuze kind of personalizes it at least in my view um but the theory offers us a way of I guess going back on our past and viewing what has come out of it is not this we're not the end of ourselves I guess in some way like this is right. not the Cameron that would would have always been made out of any events there's there's some if things had gone differently in 2017 2018 I'd would not be studying philosophy right. uh, i might be a right winger because of just what i was in like the social media platforms i was <laughs> viewing on social media not too far hopefully um i don't like to think of all the other contingent features because they're kind of no i'm just like, glad i'm not there um this is no this is exactly i mean for me like the, what, the exact experience you're describing is what i sort of think experienced when i read freud yeah. for the first time because freud um and via lacan and not but not just lacan but also Bion and say melanie klein like all of these writers they are obsessed um in a way and horrified by how active the force of contingency is in our lives how ridiculous is it that um you know i'll use the example like my father um, you know, my father had a bad experience at a doctor when he was like four years old. Um, you know, I think he got a tooth pulled or like he he had some kind of bad experience at a with a doc at a doctor. And from that point on, he hated doctors. From the moment he didn't have to see a doctor again, he wouldn't go. And, you know, 
40 years later, you don't see a doctor, you, you know, you, you're going to croak. And he did. And he got sick and he died of a cancer that he could have did not have to die of. Mostly because he was traumatized at a young age um, by an event that probably wouldn't have even been traumatic if it had been a month later or a month earlier. Like the stupidity of our lives, like the stupid fact of chance and the dice roll that has not just the, not just a butterfly effect, but just has this, you know, that I am the product, you know, I'm also the producer, but I am the product of what was done to me. And the question that Deleuze wants us to answer, I think, um, is a is a totally psychoanalytic question, which is what will you do with what has been done to you? Um, how will you claim it as your own? Yeah, the, um, this is all it, over Atari. Yeah, I guess coming from Deleuze's, I guess take on Deleuze and Guattari's take on psychoanalysis, more than necessarily just to forgive psychoanalysis of its crimes or something <laughs> i remember writing in one of my being the nothingness papers for my history class this last semester i was writing on like how bad sartre's understanding of psychoanalysis was and some mm -hmm. parts the points i'd give him to just be, if he's talking like melanie klein or something like that that aspect of psychoanalysis it does mm -hmm give in to Sartre's critique that psychoanalysis just pulls away from the fault of the individual. Mm -hmm. But with kind of Deleuze's, it is more Deleuze than Guattari, this one, but his Spinozism and, and to some degree his Nietzscheism, um, kind of with Spinoza, there's a contingency, but there's also a necessity to that contingency, which is the weird part of it. Right, um, and this is the early modern aspect of Spinoza. This yeah. is just like, you it's, know, this, and, yeah. Um, but because it's coming from Spinoza and nowhere else, Deleuze kind of avoids what Sartre is critiquing in the the absence of fault in psychoanalysis. Because what Sartre says is you can always get to this, um, mm. the unconscious, you can always get to this drive that absolves fault of the individual or the ego or whatever. And I don't really think Deleuze really... Blues having read Sartre definitely by this point. I mean, he mentions critique of dialectical reason in what I read today. If you can get through that, you can get through being a nothingness, um, just logically right. speaking there. Um, but psycho or schizoanalysis is able to avoid this whole from its Spinozism, I guess, in my interpretation at least, because I don't know if blessedness is the right term for Spinoza. You would know better than me. Blessedness was the term I found online for it. But Spinoza has this idea that you are contingently made, but there's this, but knowledge is this kind of level of, not necessarily above contingently made, but it grants you something greater than just being this yeah. contingent process. Because everything you do in Spinoza's world is the result of all these different forces combining. Mm -hmm. There's no like necessary freedom to it. There's no free will in it necessarily. Mm -hmm. But if you do end up somehow on Spinoza's route, the ability to look back through science, philosophy, etc., and understand the forces that made you up, there's a degree to where you regain that autonomy that is lost in the necessity of that contingency. Hmm. Yeah, no, like you, it is an extremely... Yeah, no, it's an extremely psychoanalytic point, I think. Yeah, like you, you and an existential point. And I mean, this is probably where, you know, how do I, I'm trying to think of where to go with this. So Spinoza, Spinoza is perhaps the most unlikely candidate for to be the great philosopher of joy. <laughs> um, to be like the man's life, was in many ways a living nightmare um he was excommunicated you know this right he was excommunicated from his jewish community yeah i i just read the deleuze's introduction to his book on yeah. spinoza where he goes over the he's excommunicated <laughs> after learning from radicals and then interpreting mm -hmm. their view of religion somebody comes and stabs him and then he just keeps the garment for the, the next 30 years of his life yeah 
He dies in what his early fifties. He dies in his early fifties from lung ailments because the way he supports himself, he's he can't participate in his family's um, shipping business, and the way he supports himself is by grinding lenses, like for microscopes, and he's so reportedly one of the best lens grinders in Europe. Um, he's very precise, um, but he inhales glass dust oh. for decades. Um, and he dies. He basically suffocates. Um, his lungs just stop working. Um, but on, on top of that, like this is a man who saw his friend, the who, God, what was there? What was his name? Um, the prime minister of the Netherlands. The, who? What was effectively the prime minister? They have a slightly different title. Was a friend of his, um, and he was torn limb from limb in the streets by an angry mob and eaten. Him and his brother, they were um, by a by a sort of royalist mob. Um, there was tensions in the Dutch Republic for a, co a complex set of reasons. And this guy who was one of Spinoza's last, you know, friends and defenders in public life, um, torn limb from limb and eaten <laughs> by an angry, you know, like, and, th and this is a man who, after that, writes the political treatise writes the great document of democracy um greatest sort of, incomplete document on democracy exactly exactly like you know i mean negri would say <laughs> you know isn't its completeness and its incompleteness something like that but you know like yeah no it's it's there is a kind of and of course like much of this is aspirational much of this is a pose that he puts on um, there is a style to the ethics and to the more geometrico, though he denies that it's a style. He says, this is math. It's not fucking math. <laughs> you know, like, it's not like, you know, if you ever read the ethics, you are totally, I did a paper on it this semester. So yeah, no, exactly. It has, as, but it has as much style as the King James Bible in a way it's as unmistakable as the King James Bible. I really um, like the, the appendix sections where he just talks in prose yeah, and he like goes on little, and he like makes fun of Descartes, and he like goes on these little side side quests. Yeah, yeah, he knew that that book would come after, out after he died. He was not holding back at all. Yeah, no, and it's just, and he knew he was dying, and he knew he was dying, you know, and he was aware that he was going to die young, that like his work would be left after him, that it might not survive. Even um, the ethics was actually assembled by a circle of his friends who were various free thinkers and Quakers um, who he corresponded with mostly about Cartesianism and other um, things, a kind of weird, a weird collection of um, goofy Dutchmen and um, kind of like Adam Smith was to Hume. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. 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 Huh. I had actually had never thought of that. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. And then Adam Smith was like, actually, Hume, I don't want to be killed either just because you die before me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the, I mean, this is what I mean when I say like, you know, philosophy happens outside of the university. Like these guys, none of these people were part of universities. They created these sort of side, these sort of um, institutions, these kind of vague and unbounded institutions that existed outside of any official standards that were funded by various ways like you know like it is there are many ways to have an intellectual life and it has been done under harder conditions than we live in right now yeah <laughs> like you know like you know, at least we have toilet paper and penicillin you know um and hopefully nobody's getting torn limb from limb in the street and eaten and no, um, nobody treats philosophers as a threat anymore. Exactly. Except except for the right. Except except for the right wingers who actually do. Um, and that's a yeah. new recent phenomenon. But mm. we got a little period where nobody thought we were a threat. They've taken the state does not think we're a threat. Yeah, that's that's a good. I mean, depends depends on which state. But this state, no. You know, France, Macron. Um, with his, you know, every other speech being about like le plus modernisme or whatever, you know, like this sort of like le gendre idéologie, like whatever, like it's. He's trying to get little pink out or something. Yeah, he's he. I, I. It all feels very kind of like. 
put on and fake. Like, I don't think he think actually thinks any of that. He's trying to get, the, he's trying to just steal enough votes away from the Le Pen. Uh, I've always thought but, Hilda goes the real leader of France anyway. Who is it? Hilda go the mayor of Paris. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, it's ugh, fucking Macron. And, and, you know, Macron was, I mean, as you wonder if philosophy makes you a better person. Macron was um, the student and in many ways, like the protege of, I'm so bad with names, Paul hey, Ricoeur. The, oh, yeah. Of Paul Ricoeur, the phenomenologist and um, sort of literary theorist. And... Yeah, he has a bunch on Verso. The, is he yeah, the one that yeah, has yeah. the emancipated subject? Is that him? I don't know. Or no, the Emancipated Spectre. I think that might be it. I, I'm not sure. I know his big book is called Narrative and Time, which okay. is like a huge two volume opus. He is a sort of like crypto Heideggerian. Um, he was, I know, it's it's confused, but but like he was Macron was his protege in a lot of ways. He was his like direct assistant in compiling texts towards the end of his life, and a lot of good it did him. He's you know. He's doing whatever he's doing. He's the neoliberalizer, and that's how he'll be remembered. Um, you know, it's totally. But anyway, um, we're way off. French topic. politics is an, an, another episode. Yeah, it's not something I can weigh in on. I can't weigh in on any of this really. Um, so wait, where were we? Yeah, Spinoza, right? Like, um, claiming one's life is one's own. Like, this is this is where I think the rubber hits the road. Um, especially with a figure like Deleuze. Um, because... I don't know if there's an academic that believes that philosophy happens outside of academia more than Deleuze. I know, exactly. Uh, maybe Guattari, but uh, no, Guattari doesn't <laughs> count. He was already he was outside of academia. Yeah, exactly. Guattari was, um, yeah, he was running Laborde. Yeah, no, like, I mean, Deleuze... Because his major references are always writers. He's fast and he's fascinated with American fiction in particular because, you know, Walt Whitman had a third grade education. Herman Melville dropped out of the seventh grade because his father was fleeing um, debt collectors. You know, um, like there is a massive tradition, especially, I mean, D.H. Lawrence was a self was self-taught there's a sort of a an obsession in Deleuze with the um self-taught with the autodidact with us with the minor um and this is what yeah. it means to be minor in many ways right and I think that the sort of becoming minor bits of you know in Kafka and in all those sort of like in those books like yeah in this Proust book like you know there is this Because what Deleuze likes about these figures is that they don't, and this is where I think the, the difference between theory and philosophy, I don't think of theory as philosophy. I think of theory as the, you know, Deleuze says that philosophy is the production of concepts or whatever, right? Like in what is philosophy? I actually, like, I, that is how I think of theory. I think of it as the production of concepts that are in a way made to stand on their own. Philosophy, I think of as systematic as sort of deriving as more geometrico as cartesianism as like like that like whereas theory is a sort of like it produces concepts like william burroughs does just churns them out just says shit in some ways begins somewhere one has to begin somewhere and what deleuze likes about these writers is that they just begin um that they're not shy about it and from there Sorry, my neighbor is um, taking the trash out. Um, and from where they begin, he's able to work. He's able to sort of wrap it in, like into not a system, because I wouldn't say Deleuze is a systematic thinker, um, though he is more systematic than we give him credit for, probably. Um, does that, does that? Yeah, I, I, I was kind of referring to, I'm going through the ABC series for Deleuze, because huh. it, it's all translated on YouTube now with subtitles um, and gives me a little bit of practice for French where I could be like, oh, I understand that when he says Montanon, he's saying now. Um, right. <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, as I try to be slowly, slowly become fluent. Um, but I'm in the middle of C, I think it's C pour culture. Um, and he's talking about the fold because I, I believe it was his last book at the time. These. I, I'm fairly sure it takes place between the fold and uh, what is philosophy. So 
Right. God, when would that be? Somewhere between like 89 to 91 or something like that. That would probably be 91, yeah. Um, What is philosophy came out after Guattari died in 90, I believe. So, yeah. I I thought it came out like a couple months before he died. Hmm. I thought What is philosophy came out in 91 and Guattari passes the next year. Well, he did. It's very close. Yeah. Uh, Because I know Deleuze wrote most of it. It it doesn't really matter, but go on, go on. Um, But he's talking about the fold at this time. um, And particularly, he's not necessarily talking about the concepts of the book. uh, But rather, he's talking about all these letters he received because of the book. Um, And he's talking about tossing out all the boring ones from philosophers and stuff. (laughs) And then he got one from like a, a, a surfer who was saying that, Oh, the waves, the experience of us surfing, that that's kind of how I connect to the fold. Um, mm-hmm. Then he got like children that do, uh, or maybe teenagers that do like newspaper printing. Um, and there were a few other examples, but what was important to him was the kind of aspect that they are outside of this a- academic, right. I guess, apparatus, that the ability to read this book on what's, a philosopher that would have been what dead for almost 250 years at that point if not a little longer um a book on that on leibniz just becomes this thing that is grants just surfers teenagers working a part-time job like they all identify with these concepts and are able to apply them to their i guess daily life and function that that's kind of the connection I was having, um, particularly yeah, yeah. with how you discuss theory. Yeah, and it, it gives you a grip on your life. Yeah. No, I God, you know, the fold is the hardest Deleuze book, and I do not understand a freaking word of it. I do not know what is happening in that book. Maybe, maybe you I should know, go surfing. Uh no, I shouldn't. I absolutely should not go surfing. No, but no, but like I this is I think that intellectual culture in France especially is very different from here. There is a sense that I get from my undergraduates that I've heard from my friends um, who are sort of not in academia, but are like, you know, intellectual people in their own way um, that the only place you can do serious intellectual work is in the university. This is ridiculous. That is a ridiculous statement. The university is not not only is that is the university not the only place you can do serious intellectual work it is actively much more difficult because there are in an infinite number of um what's the word um enticements to do something that is deeply unserious to use yeah <laughs> to use my favorite twitter insult um you know to produce a certain kind of boring rote um philosophy of riverdale I love Riverdale. Don't you dare. I was trying to find a show that nobody loved. But oh, I mean, yeah. my mind immediately, it was like the philosophy of Looney Tunes. And I was like, I would actually love that book. Um, no, it's the philosophy of like NCIS. That's is, that's the type of shit I was thinking. I forget that, those shows exist. Yeah. Um, no. you know, you, did you know NCIS is about boat crime? It's about crimes that happen on boats. It's yeah, the no, they're Navy. Navy. Crime. What? It's the Navy crime unit. I know. I did, yeah. It, Sometimes somebody, they take place like, off of boats. Okay, it's all boat based, though. It's all it's boat centric, even though not all. Anyway, but the point is like <laughs> twenty seasons. Yeah, like the point is like there there is a massive ecosystem of theoretical work happening. There is, um, you know, there's people like Taylor who is um yeah. sort of academia who translates. And people buy those freaking books. The, his I machine gun, yeah, his machine gun conscious translation has gone through, I think, like almost a dozen printings. Like, you know, there, it is people want to read this stuff, you know, and there is an urge to it. Like, but at the same time, but that I struggle to understand this because. Yes, you go into work every day. You're at your job for eight hours. You sit at a desk. You do all this boring stuff. You come home. Your brain is wiped. All you want to do is have a beer 
and like hang out and watch some terrible television, whatever. Like I get that. I do that sometimes too. You know, it's hard to think, but like, what else is there? Like, what else? Like, what what else are you gonna do with your fucking day? Chicago you know? Fire. <laughs> there you go. That's the whole Chicago universe. Chicago PD. No, I I FBI, I have Chicago, Chicago MD all on TikTok, and the yep. psychiatrist is really fun to watch because yeah. he's like, it feels like there's a guy that should be in House that's just in this generic TV show. No, House is a masterpiece. House was one of the first television shows I ever loved as a kid, and it produced like the hypochondria that I suffer from every day now. Which I share with Deleuze, also hypochondriac, for the record. Well, he didn't have a long, so. Yeah, yeah, you know. God, I mean, do you think Deleuze killed himself or not? I I, I remember on Machine Income Conscious, it was either when I was going to work as a lifeguard in the very early morning or very, uh, like, after it got dark at night. I yeah. can't remember. But somebody offered the theory that the people that suffer with Deleuze's, um, I don't know if it's disease or condition. The people who suffer with Deleuze's condition, yeah. occasionally when they get fresh air, they just kind of walk forward or something. Somebody else oh. had a better explanation of it. But yeah, I believe that. there's oh. the belief that like it could have been something psychological, not necessarily yeah. suicide, but something to do with having his condition for, what, 40 years? Jesus. Just people who yeah. suffer with that just kind of yeah. not necessarily kill themselves, but end up in an accident that ends their life. Yeah. No, this is, um, I mean, because in the same way that like, f we don't remember this now because Deleuze has been so, so feted by um, American English departments and stuff. But like when Deleuze, when Deleuze died, his suicide was basically used as slander against him or what may, may or may not have been his suicide. Yeah. In the same way that Fisher, when Fisher died, people like a, an academic whose name I will not repeat on this podcast um, posted a tweet after Fisher died, um, basically saying like, well, I might be a liberal shill, but at least I'm alive still, you know, just. Is this this guy? Is it a guy that has anything to do with Heidegger? Does he have anything to do with Heidegger? Not if, if you have to ask the question, the answer is not the guy I'm thinking of. Not the guy you're thinking of. No, but it's just like. The, I don't think he's that mean spirited. Yeah, I just wanted to know. Certain, no, it was an incredibly mean spirited, nasty thing to say, like about some, you know. But I think that the, it's it's a kind of academic resentment against people who Fisher and Deleuze, like who do not feel constrained by the demands of the academy. Yeah, in the way that professional philosophers do, and their response is to call that unserious. Um, and it is, and to me, to my mind, it is pure resentment. Um, in the worst sense, in a sort of life denying, thought denying strategy that tries to bring everything in the world down to its level. Um, and yeah, like if m most people, you know, most of us are going to start a blog and it's going to suck ass. I have a blog that sucks ass, you know. So do like, I. Yeah, like, and that's fine, man. Like, but at least you're doing something. I like, hope it doesn't actually suck ass, but it's just basically me <laughs> philosophical ramblings at 11 p.m. And I'm like, everybody else on Substack's doing these like really detailed articles, and I'm gonna feel a bit about this one at 9:30 yeah. when I wake up tomorrow. Yeah, but yeah. it's it's a practice. But that's the whole. Book. It's a practice, and this is what philosophy is for Deleuze, especially is it is a daily practice. You wake up and you sort of, you know, it's easy to be kind of new agey and annoying about it. Like it's not yoga or Tai Chi or anything, but it's, it's a, it's a way of being in the world that is undetermined or like that, that is not undetermined, but more, but less determined than a lot of other ways of being in the world. You know, there's no and and it can be heroic, it can be, or it can be totally humble. Like I, I just, you know, I fully believe that. Um, what am I trying to say here? Yeah, I get like this. Real this conversation really did not go in the direction I. I had this this whole set of notes about just like what I think theory is and where I think theory goes and what is and is not theory. I had a whole graph 
where I like named names and <laughs> called people. But like, but but no, like, like I think this gets to the heart Get of it. To chew gum that, and kick ass. Yeah, exactly. And I'm all out of gum. Yeah. No. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm all out of ass. <laughs> oh, you know, it's in a way. It's what Jameson says. It's a form of writing, and writing is a, and a, and as Wittgenstein says, a language is a form of life. Yeah, right. It's a style through which we move. Um, and you know, I mean, what better what better answer do we need than that? I mean, yeah. Like, like, yeah, like, like, you know, should there be a, a politics attached? Yes. Like, should there, like, you know, do we, do we need to be right thinking people? Like, yeah. Like, I'm not saying like it all, anything goes. You yeah. Know? That, that's kind of the hard part after you get to Nietzsche. It's like, okay, well, I've got rid of morals. How do I make <laughs> sure that we have some constraints now? I think that that requires in some ways, like a leap, you know, like a recognition that like the only life worth living is collective. Yeah. The only happy life is collective. And I don't mean like in the Hobbesian sense, you know. It's like, like the one big thing. Yeah, I, I I remember, I don't know if you ever saw this on Twitter, but it was this egoist anarchist who only read like Nietzsche and Starner, but the philosophy they got out of it was they should commit as many crimes as possible, including oh. probably like assault, if not murder. Like it was really bad. Yeah. Did you, no, did you see is, that tweet? This no, there was a story. I mean, do you um the um Leopold and Loeb? Have you heard this? There was a pair of um a pair of you know men in their early twenties in like the nineteen. I think it was like the nineteen early nine early twentieth century who you know read Nietzsche and decided that they were themselves the Ubermensch and they were going to commit like the perfect crime by like murdering some eleven year old boy. And they did. And you know what? They got caught in like fucking four minutes. Like they got immediately caught. The, the per- was, that was the perfect crime? Yeah. No, Child it, it was murder? Not perfect enough, baby. You know, because they got so caught by like the Chicago PD, which, who are who were not then and are not now known for their clearance record. Um, but, you know, like, no, like there is there is a totally dangerous... I mean, and like Dostoevsky, right? This is the whole plot of Crime and Punishment. Like, did they not read Crime and Punishment? Like, <laughs> probably not. You know, That's too big like, for them. It, yeah, it's fair. Yeah, yeah. No, I like aphorisms. Yeah, but like, you know, you don't want to say that. You don't want like, you know. But I guess I'm with Sartre on this point in that like, this is a totally life denying. Like, you think you're being Nietzschean, cool and Nietzsche edgy. Was, Nietzsche would. Sp- bit on these people like these freaks in dime square you know i don't know like i know like you know these the sort of like um you know red scare um right like new york city right oh the, the people that go so far left that they end up being like a fascist no not even those people i or mean they, like they you, wrap around they care about working class issues so much that they become like a no, right winger no i mean like there's a there's a small if you don't know about this, you're lucky. I've been There's... to New York twice and it's been on like trips with my school. So I haven't been able to like experience it as like this. I haven't experienced this... the pretentious culture of New York City. So there's a small scene of extremely pathetic ar- artists and writers down in down in uh, Chinatown in the West Village now who like who isn't there always are trying to... no who are trying to make a certain kind of like right wing artistic practice popular don't look it up um the point is that like this there's a certain like this is resentment you know i mean i need to like, know, i don't think i should promote it on the podcast while recording but afterwards can, can you send me what it is because i want to see how bad it is yeah edit this whole thing <laughs> like my whole point is like my my whole point is like you know And maybe this is not, this is a totally unphilosophical and untheoretical point, but just, you know, a life, a, a life of sort of resentment and reactivity um, in the Deleuzean Nietzschean sense is an unhappy life. 
you know, it's all sad passions, baby. Yeah. No, like it does not like you know, the only and and in this way, I'm like I'm a Lacanian, I think, in that and a Sartrean, in that like I think the only way to move forward is to affirm your life, is to say this has been done to me. It is uh, it's happened in the stupid, brutal vortex of contingent material reality into which I've been thrown. Um I live at this moment in history. I need a map, a cognitive system through which I can understand what's happening to me and to everybody I know and love. And I can act from there. Yeah. I I can't, you know, I mean, it, it sounds fucking trite, but like, you know, I think that almost everybody who comes to philosophy comes to it because they had some version of that experience that they... You know, philosophy is not. I had a teacher when I was in high school, actually, who said, um, "Aristotle says philosophy is born of wonder." Bullshit. <laughs> philosophy is born out of disappointment. It's what happens after disappointment, after the world's let you down. <laughs> what do you do with that? You start to, you start to wonder why. Yeah, um, I, I believe that. I think that that's as close to a universal statement as we can make. Is that fair? Yeah, that's a pretty good place to also end on, I think. Yeah. All right. I don't want to make it too long. We can continue talking after it's done recording, but I only want to upload so much. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm I'm so embarrassed myself. Okay. It's going to be great. There's like two minutes out of this. I probably should edit. But um, yeah, but thank you for coming on. I'd love to have you on again for something else. Maybe not episode 20, but if I do keep the podcast (laughs) on later on. Um, but to the people on YouTube or Spotify or wherever you're listening to this, uh, thank you for somehow getting to the hour 20 mark. Um, if that person ever exists, thank you. Um, and hope to see you for the next episode.